along and this is VOA One. Let's. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear stories from Katie Weaver and Brian Lynn. Alice Bryant presents this week's Ask a Teacher. She answers a question from an English learner in Suriname. We close the show with an American story. This week, it is Feathertop by Nathaniel Hawthorne. But first, at a pizza restaurant in downtown Kabul, workers and customers are worried about Afghanistan's new Taliban rulers. Some, however, say they are more worried about economic collapse than things like being forced to grow long facial hair a practice from the Taliban's earlier time in power. Others fear for the future of their children. With the Taliban now in control, some in Kabul are thinking of ways to escape the country. I have to run away so I can feed my family, said Mustafa, a server at another nearby fast food place. He had come to the pizza restaurant for tea and to talk with friends working there. Mustafa told the Associated Press that he has a family of 11 to support. He is considering seeking work in neighboring Iran. He said his earnings have been cut by 75 percent since the Taliban overran Kabul. Pizzeria owner Mohammed Yassin said daily sales have dropped sharply. He has been looking through old emails, searching for a foreigner who might help him resettle overseas. It's not for me I want to leave, but for my children, he said. Still, there is a sense of a return to business as usual across much of the Afghan capital. It is a different feeling than what was taking place at the Kabul airport, where thousands pushed toward gates for days, hoping for a chance to leave. In much of Kabul, the usual busy traffic is back. Markets have opened. On the streets, the same police who served in the Washington Allied government of President Ashraf Ghani are still waving their hands, trying to control the busy activity. Taliban fighters have taken up positions in front of most government ministries. Some are in military clothes. Others wear the traditional Afghan clothes of loose pants and a long shirt called a tunic. Street sellers have even been able to make a profit by selling the Taliban's white flag. Shah Mohammed makes up to $15 a day selling different sizes of the flag. He makes his way through traffic, waving the small flags at passing cars. He also has full-sized flags on offer. Before the Taliban takeover, he sold cloths for cleaning cars. He said that would earn him only about $4 a day. But financial problems are affecting many others in the city. Salaries have gone unpaid. Government ministries that employ hundreds of thousands of people are barely operating, even as the Taliban have urged some to return to work. Outside the Afghan National Bank, thousands are lining up trying to take out money. The Taliban have limited weekly withdrawals to 200 U.S. dollars. Norula has been operating a small store for 11 years. He said he has not had a single customer since the Taliban arrived on August 15th. He said he cannot pay the rent on his store. 
The banks are closed. All the people who have money are running away from this country, he said. No one is bringing money here. Norula said he has no chance to leave. He is not sure he would leave even if he could. He said if the economy improved, he would stay, even with the Taliban in power. I was born here, he said. I lived here all my life. I will die here. Thinking about the 20 year U.S. military presence in his country, Norula said America did not do a good job here. They let corruption grow until there was nothing left. British researchers have explored how a robotic finger can affect a person's ability to play the piano. The experiment involved attaching a robotic finger on the right hand of twelve test subjects. Six of the individuals were piano players, six were not. The leader of the project was Professor Aldo Faisal, a neuroscientist at Britain's Imperial College of London. Being a piano player himself, he said he wondered how his playing ability would be affected if he had an extra finger. So I started really with a robotics challenge, Faisal told Reuters news agency. Can we build a robotic thumb that can sit on the opposite side of the right hand? And play music with it? The robotic finger was controlled by electrical signals produced by the foot movements of the piano players. Faisal said the robotic finger felt very unnatural and was difficult for players to get used to at first. But after a few hours using the device, He said it almost felt like an extension of you. Faisal noted that within an hour of being fitted with the robotic finger, six players had learned to use it effectively with the piano keys. There's a dedicated area of your brain responsible for every single finger, Faisal said. If I give you an eleventh finger, are you processing it the same way as you're processing a regular limb? Researchers involved in the experiment reported that the six pianists and six non playing volunteers all quickly adapted to using the extra thumb. They said this result suggests. People are not limited to using an extra finger only for things they already know how to do. The fact that you can actually play with eleven fingers has to do with how your brain is actually wired up, Faisal said. So, what we can say is it's a proof of existence. We can do it. So the next challenge would be can we do two thumbs, so twelve fingers? He added, it's a very exciting moment in time now to see what we can do. I'm Brian Lynn. Cinematic Universe releases its 25th film this week with a hero new to movies. Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings is based on a comic book series first published in 1973. 
Actor Simu Liu plays the lead character, Shang-Chi. As the movie opens, he is a low-level hotel worker in San Francisco. He rides the bus to work. He does not appear especially powerful or brave. But by the time the film is over, Shang-Chi is a valuable addition to the Marvel Universe. He proves to be a dependable fighter whose bravery is tested again and again. And he has a new transportation system. Forget the bus, Shang-Chi rides dragons. In the story, he has run away from his oppressive father, a man more than 1,000 years old who seeks to control the universe. Shang-Chi's father is in possession of ten magical rings that give him extraordinary powers. Shang-Chi had fled because his father wanted him to become an assassin, someone who murders people as a job. But now the old man wants the family back for an operation to rescue his dead wife. Actor Aquafina plays Shang-Chi's friend, Katie. The character brings humor to the story, especially in tense situations. Destin Daniel Cretton is the director of the new film and helped write the script. It includes many strange characters and places. For example, Morris is a pig chicken creature with no face. Another is an assassin with a huge knife for an arm. There is an underground fight ring, forests that move, and exciting fight scenes, including one high above the streets on the outside of a very tall building. Beneath the beauty and the violence, however, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings is a story about family ties, fatherly expectations, and the modern world's demands over individual traditions. I'm Katie Weaver. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from Ichiro in Japan. He writes, Dear VOA, Japanese people don't understand Christian religious terms such as religious leaders, clergy, and clergymen. What are the differences? Hi, Ichiro. The terms clergy and clergymen are general and can describe any official leaders within established religions. Clergymen is plural and used when the leaders are men. Clergy women is the plural form for women. Within Christianity, there are several terms for the leadership roles. Many are less commonly known even by some Christians. Christianity is divided into several smaller subgroups or sects. Examples of Christian sects include Catholics, Baptists, and Protestants. The Catholic Church has a long list of religious leaders. In Catholicism, Priests are leaders who perform religious services, such as worship services and ceremonies. In fact, all clergy in the Catholic Church 
including priests, bishops, and deacons, are permitted to give sermons or religious speeches. They also can lead worship and perform religious ceremonies, such as marriages and funerals. The highest leader in the Catholic Church is the Pope, who lives in the Vatican, an independent city-state inside Rome, Italy. The current Pope is Pope Francis. Baptist and Protestant churches have far fewer leaders than the Catholic Church. They call their main religious leader any of three names, pastor, minister, or reverend. This person leads church services, performs religious ceremonies, and gives spiritual or religious guidance to church members. There is, however, one role common to Catholics, Baptists, and Protestants. It is that of deacon. Deacons have a lower status than a church's main religious leader. They are considered servant leaders and help carry out the duties of priests and pastors. They are also expected to build a relationship with the local church community. And that's Ask a Teacher for this week. I'm Alice Bryant. Our story today is called Feathertop. It was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. The long cold winter was gone at last. At first the cold nights went away slowly. Then, suddenly, the warm days of spring started to come. There was new life again in the earth. Things started to grow and come up. For the first time, green corn plants began to show. They pushed through the soil and could now be seen above the ground. After the long winter months, the crows, the big black birds were hungry, and when they saw the little green plants, they flew down to eat them. Old Mother Rigby tried to make the noisy and hungry birds go away. They made her very angry. She did not want the blackbirds to eat her corn, but the birds would not go away. So, Early one morning, just as the sun started to rise, Mother Rigby jumped out of bed. She had a plan to stop those black birds from eating her corn. Mother Rigby could do anything. She was a witch, a woman with strange powers. She could make water run uphill or change a beautiful woman into a white horse. Many nights, when the moon was full and bright, she could be seen flying over the tops of the houses in the village, sitting on a long wooden stick. It was a broomstick, and it helped her to do all sorts of strange tricks. Mother Rigby ate a quick breakfast and then started to work on her broomstick. She was planning to make something that would look like a man. It would fill the birds with fear and scare them from eating her corn the way most farmers protect themselves from those black, pesky birds. Mother Rigby worked quickly. She held her magic broomstick straight and then tied another piece of wood across it. And already it began to look like a man with arms. 
Then she made the head. She put a pumpkin, a vegetable the size of a football, on top of the broomstick. She made two small holes in the pumpkin for eyes and made another cut, lower down, that looked just like a mouth. At last, there he was. He seemed ready to go to work for Mother Rigby and stop those old birds from eating her corn. But Mother Rigby was not happy with what she made. She wanted to make her scarecrow look better and better, for she was a good worker. She made a purple coat and put it around her scarecrow and dressed it in white silk stockings. She covered him with false hair and an old hat. And in that hat she stuck the feather of a bird. She examined him closely and decided she liked him much better now, dressed up in a beautiful coat with a fine feather on top of his hat, and she named him Feathertop. She looked at Feathertop and laughed with happiness. He is a beauty, she thought. Now what? she thought. "'feeling troubled again. "'She felt that Feathertop looked too good to be a scarecrow. "'He can do something better,' she thought, "'than just stand near the corn all summer and scare the crows.' "'And she decided on another plan for Feathertop. "'She took the pipe of tobacco she was smoking "'and put it into the mouth of Feathertop.' Puff, darling, puff, she said to Feathertop. Puff away, my fine fellow. It is your life. Smoke started to rise from Feathertop's mouth. At first, it was just a little smoke, but Feathertop worked hard, blowing and puffing, and more and more smoke came out of him. Puff away, my pet. Mother Rigby said with happiness, Puff away, my pretty one. Puff for your life, I tell you. Mother Rigby then ordered Feathertop to walk. Go forward, she said. You have a world before you. Feathertop put one hand out in front of him, trying to find something for support. At the same time, he pushed one foot forward with great difficulty. But Mother Rigby shouted and ordered him on, and soon he began to go forward. Then she said, You look like a man, and you walk like a man. Now I order you to talk like a man. Feathertop gasped, struggled, and at last said in a small whisper, Mother, I want to speak, but I have no brain. What can I say? Ah, you can speak, Mother Rigby answered. What shall you say? Have no fear. When you go out into the world, you will say a thousand things and say them a thousand times, and saying them a thousand times again and again, you still will be saying nothing. So just talk, babble like a bird. Certainly you have enough of a brain for that much money and said, Now you are as good as any of them and can hold your head high with importance. But she told Feathertop that he must never lose his pipe and must never let it stop smoking. She warned him that if his pipe ever stopped smoking, 
he would fall down and become just a bundle of sticks again. Have no fear, mother, Feathertop said in a big voice and blew a big cloud of smoke out of his mouth. On your way, Mother Rigby said, pushing Feathertop out the door. The world is yours, and if anybody asks you for your name, just say Feathertop. For you have a feather in your hat and a handful of feathers in your empty head. Feathertop found the streets in town, and many people started to look at him. They looked at his beautiful purple coat and his white silk stockings, and at the pipe he carried in his left hand, which he put back into his mouth every five steps he walked. They thought that he was a visitor of great importance. What a fine, noble face, one man said. He surely is somebody, said another, a great leader of men. As Feathertop walked along one of the quieter streets near the edge of town, he saw a very pretty girl standing in front of a small red brick house. A little boy was standing next to her. The pretty girl smiled at Feathertop, and love entered her heart. It made her whole face bright with sunlight. Feathertop looked at her and had a feeling he never knew before. Suddenly, everything seemed a little different to him. The air was filled with a strange excitement. The sunlight glowed along the road, and people seemed to dance as they moved through the streets. Feathertop could not stop himself and walked toward the pretty, smiling young girl. As he got closer, the little boy at her side pointed his finger at Feathertop and said, Look, Polly, the man has no face. It is a pumpkin. Feathertop moved no closer, but turned around and hurried through the streets of the town toward his home. When Mother Rigby opened the door, she saw Feathertop shaking with emotion. He was puffing on his pipe with great difficulty and making sounds like the clatter of sticks or the rattling of bones. What's wrong? Mother Rigby asked. I am nothing, Mother. I am not a man. I am just a puff of smoke. I want to be something more than just a puff of smoke. And Feathertop took his pipe and with all his strength smashed it against the floor. He fell down and became a bundle of sticks as his pumpkin face rolled toward the wall. Poor Feathertop, Mother Rigby said, looking at the heap on the floor. He was too good to be a scarecrow, and he was too good to be a man. But he will be happier, standing near the corn all summer, and protecting it from the birds. So I will make him a scarecrow again. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.